Hi, everybody. It is 2.30 and it's Friday. That means it's time for our Family Friday. And I am so happy that you are here and you are joining us. We're going to talk today about the beautiful macaw parrot birds that actually lived on the Colorado Plateau. Now, they're not native to the Colorado Plateau, but we're going to talk about why were those birds here so long ago? And I'm going to invite Kelly to come over and explain this interesting, wonderful map to us. Great to be here, Mary, and welcome, everybody. We're going to talk today about all the different things that were traded from all different directions to the people who lived here in the Flagstaff area about a thousand years ago. And then we're going to focus right in on these tropical birds called macaws that are very colorful, and we'll get to meet some in person shortly. But let's take a look at this map. So we're here in Flagstaff in the northern part of Arizona, and archaeologists call the ancient people who lived here Sanawa, but they're part of the ancestral Puebloan tradition. So these are the ancestors of the people who live at Hopi, um, Pueblo of Zuni, Pueblo of Acoma today, and the Rio Grande Pueblos in New Mexico. So they're descendants, the people who live with us today, and the ancestors are the ancient people. So the ancient people a thousand years ago traveled all over this region, and they also traded with people who came from other regions. And some of the things they traded were seashells, from the California coast, seashells from down here in this area, the Gulf of California or the Sea of Cortez, and they traded for pottery from the Hohokam area in Phoenix and Tucson, and all kinds of salt from the Zuni area and different places, the Verde Valley, if you know where Sedona is, um, there was a salt mine near there. Turquoise from Nevada and, and different places in southern Arizona. They traded pottery, different colors and kinds of pottery with beautiful designs. And they traded these macaws from way south in southern Mexico. They're tropical birds who live in the jungle. And people brought them up when they were very young and raised them along the way and here and people used their feathers and we'll, we're going to be talking about why did they want these colorful birds. Now you said that these people went around, they traveled around mm -hmm. trading these wonderful items. Now how did they get around? Well they had to walk and they weren't just trading, they were also migrating. We've all heard of migration when people move their homes. Mm -hmm. So they were not only carrying things to trade with each other, but they're probably carrying everything they own with them um, sometimes and, and moving in, in large family groups and they would settle someplace else other than, than where they were born and raised. So we have a lot of oral traditions, traditional histories about these migrations in the Pueblos. And one of the clans that migrated, so a clan is a, or a, a large group of families that are related, one of the clans is named after the parrots. So there's a parrot clan that migrated from the south and settled in different pueblos. And what we have here is the cranium, or the head bones, of a macaw. And I want you to look at this beak right here, this hooked beak is very distinctive. And that's, that's how we know what kind of bird that was. It also had very big eyes right here. That's part of, of where the eye went. And this is the ear hole back here. So the time that we're talking about was before the Spanish came here with any horses. You got around by walking on your, train. On your feet. Kind of birds. This is, this is a crane. Okay. And it's another clan um, that Pueblos have. So some people are, are related to the crane through their crane clan. It's a water bird. It has long legs for wading in the water. 
So it's associated with water and moisture, which is really important for growing crops like corn, beans, and squash. But the word crop means something else also. Oh, so this is just a, a different word. Yeah. And that is a sack that a bird has behind its beak and above its stomach. And this crane has a, a crop sticking out that, so you can see it. It's more hidden than most birds, but some cranes, it kind of sticks out in their, their neck or their chest and you can see it. And what a crop is, is where the food goes first, it's a very muscular organ, so it contracts and expands and it grinds up the food. It's kind of like a gravel grinder. Wow. <laughs> and then, then the bird can, can swallow the food into its stomach and digest it better. So one of our vocabulary words for today is masticate, and that means to chew. And humans chew with our teeth and, and make the food soft before we swallow it, and we can digest it better and get more nutrition from it. And also with humans, we'll choke if we don't chew our food. Oh, yeah. And that's pretty rare in the animal world, but it's a trade-off that we made because we get to talk. And parrots can talk too, but they don't have teeth. But they have to masticate their food. They have to chew their food to give their babies to digest. So babies need masticated food to digest. They need chewed food, but there's no teeth. So how do the birds chew? And they chew in their crop. And then they can either regurgitate. There's another word that we use to mean throw up, <laughs> but they're not sick. They're, that's what they do naturally, is they bring that back out of the crop and feed it to the babies with their beak. Or if they're feeding themselves, they'll, they'll swallow it down to their stomach and then they can absorb the nutrition much better after it's been masticated in their crop. Wow, that is very interesting. That's how the macaw and how birds eat and digest. Then. I have a friend here with me. This is Kelly Taylor. And Kelly, you have a very beautiful friend with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and why do we have this beautiful bird with us today? I'm director of Sacred Scarlets. We are a 501c3 and our mission is to promote conservation of scarlet macaws and bring about awareness of their history in the Southwest. And here we have Bonita. She is a scarlet macaw of the subspecies Aramacau cyanopteris, which is the northern subspecies of scarlet macaws. She is the subspecies that would have been brought here to Arizona. Um, my love for birds started when I was six years old. I've always had birds. I've never been without birds. Wow. And um, the scarlet macaws, I um, gained a lot of interest when I found out that they were brought here to the Southwest. And that really began my love affair with the scarlets. So I've had, I have currently, I... Um, I'm the keeper of two scarlet macaws. She is the youngest. She is four years old. The scarlet macaw is native to Central and South America. There are about 19 subspecies. But the way we can tell a parrot is they have the curved beak, as you can see. They yes, have the <laughs> bare facial uh, patch, which they're very, very small feathers there. Her feet are what we call zygodactyl. That's two toes forward and two toes backwards. Um, the long tail, the very long tapered wings. Oh, she that's a very to... nice fan. <laughs> <laughs> and we're holding on to her because she is flighted, as you can tell, but we want her to stay right here in the picture. Yeah, we, don't want, we don't want you taking off, Bonita. Now, was there a reason why she just did that? Um, probably no. <laughs> she's wanting to fly, stretch, stretch a little bit. Um, 
just having fun. Her, her age, she, as I said, she's four years old. And in the wild, she'd be hanging around with other four year old, other young, youngsters, anyway, but they leave their parents when they are a year old. So then they hang around for the next four, five, six years with other pre-sub-adult birds. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the life of a family of, of parrots? Well, parrots live in tropical lowland areas. Um, they, we often see parrots in the wild in pairs, and that's because that is what they do. They pair up. And these companionships can last a lifetime, or just as humans, they can change. So when they do pair up, at a certain age, then some, not all, will begin to reproduce. And that is something that can also take years to have successful clutches. That's the babies. So they nest in the hollows of trees. They're about two feet deep down in that tree. They can carve that wood and make a wonderful uh, chipped wood nest down in there. Mom will lay generally two to three eggs um, after 28-day incubation, uh, those eggs will hatch. Anyway, they stay in that nest for 90 days. The mother stays there. The father will bring food for the mother and feed her. Then the babies stay there growing until they're about 90 days of age. Now, shortly before that, they will crawl up on the side of that nest and start to peer out and watch what's going on. Some, it's not clockwork, but it's pretty darn close that they will fledge at that 90 days. Fledging means that they will take their first flight. Those first two weeks of that bird's life of flight is probably some of the most dangerous times of that bird's life. I can imagine. Yeah. Their skills are completely undeveloped. Their feathers, which growing, are continuing to grow. Um, they are susceptible to breakage, and if the feather is still growing, it, it can break, and they can actually bleed to death. Or an accident they could have, crashing into trees, predators, so those first two weeks is pretty rough. The next year, actually, uh, for the remaining nine months, they'll stay with the parents. So they're a little family for a whole year with each other. Yes. Oh, nice. Yes, they are. And during that period of time, they will learn flight skills, develop those flight skills, learn predatory evasion. They will learn where the food sources are, where water sources are, mm -hmm. and that continues, as I said, for, uh, for another nine months. And right then at about a year, then they will break away and then join their other macaws of similar age. They will not go back to that nest. Once they fledge, they don't go back to that nest at all. The parents will keep them out of that nest. Mm -hmm. Once they're about a year old, they... Uh, yes, but, okay. but even before, once they fledge, they actually do not go back. But they still can hang out with mom and dad. Yes. But just not in the nest. Yes. Wow. Yes. Very interesting, She's Bonita. And they have different kinds of feathers, don't they? Yes, they um, When we were getting set up, um, this little feather, I don't know if you can... That is the little feather that came out of Bonita when we were setting up. And if you see this, this looks so much different than her beautiful coloring feathers. So um, Kelly, what's, what's going on here? Why are there different feathers? Okay, well first off, this is what we call a down feather. This oh, is this what's in my pillow or my blanket? Yes, it is. Okay. And this feather, it's for insulation, for warmth, and these feathers, are interspersed in between her other feathers. And if you look, her body, you can see, is completely covered, except for her feet. We even have very small feathers on her face. Mm -hmm. But so what we have first, we have, for example, her primary feathers. Ooh. She's, 
There she goes. Uh huh. You can she see them. Leave my feathers alone. You see that beautiful? You see that you, you that was a perfect view, perfect view of those primary feathers. Then we have her long tail feathers. Mm -hmm. This feather, these two central tail feathers are very specific to the scarlet macaw. They are the only macaw that has feathers of that length. Very distinctive. These feathers, when fully grown, can reach 27 inches, wow. even longer sometimes. Beautiful. Then we have the feathers on the body, the contour feathers. And that's all the other feathers that contour her body. And again, they're all different sizes and shapes. We have tiny little feathers here on her head. Those very, very fine, delicate, long, thin feathers on her, over her ear. Oh, she has ears. She has ears, yes. too. Yes. They're, they're like ear holes. Ear holes. Okay. Actually. Um, we've got some beautiful feathers underneath. We can oh, show yeah. her bottom there yeah. and the beautiful coloration here. Some beautiful You're feathers You're not shy. Here. No. We're manhandling her here. <laughs> But she's, she's, she's cooperating very well. Yes. As far as I know, there's no real explanation um, as to these colors. Um, you know, against the sky, looking down as if a predator down on her, it's still really very unclear as to what, why that coloring has evolved. Well, it sure is beautiful. That her eyes are on either side of her head. They are not frontal facing eyes. So with that, she gets uh, a very, very broad view of eye range. So she can always be on the lookout for predators. What kind of things could attack um, parrots out in the wild, the macaw out in the wild. Okay, um, absolutely, the raptors. The raptor birds. Yes, okay. raptors, um, which includes the owls, mm -hmm. hawks, mm -hmm. eagles. Um, in this area, what we have is the golden eagle. That would probably be the predator that could mm -hmm. take her on the easiest. Her size actually prevents a lot. In the wild, again, we have those animals, the predators, ring-tailed cats Ooh. that can uh, destroy nests, and snakes. They tend to be occasionally monkeys as well, too. Okay, and what does Bonita eat herself? What does she like? Pine nuts. <laughs> she turned her head. She turned her head when you said pine nuts. In the wild, they eat fruits, seeds, flower buds, leaf buds, occasionally insects, grubs. Uh, 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 very, I don't think that was her favorite. <laughs> like, very varied. In captivity, we have uh, available now wonderful foods that have been specially formulated for the macaws and that's something and for parrots in general and that's something that is really of recent development for years and years people um, unknowingly uh, would feed them diets of sunflower seed and continue to do this today it's just sunflower seed millet seed and this sort but that does not provide the nutrition that, that the birds actually need. So Kelly, a lot of people may see this program and fall in love with Bonita. I've fallen in love with you. You were very beautiful. However, birds can be kind of difficult and a lot of responsibility as pets. Would you like to talk about that? Yes, definitely, thank you. Um, Parrots are not domesticated animals. Sometimes we think or incorrectly use the term domesticated to refer to an animal that's brought into our home or in captivity. Domestic animals are bred for specific traits, behaviors. 
These birds have not been domesticated at all. So we're basically bringing in a wild animal. You might as well bring in a t lion, a tiger, a bear, something like this. They have very special needs, diet, um, their behavior has um, actually requires very specific uh, knowledge to bird what it needs if they don't succumb to accident or disease. Mm -hmm. They can live as long as we do. That is a commitment. It's a very strong commitment, mm -hmm. especially considering the amount of time and care needed, the constant daily cleaning, toys, interaction. So if you take these birds on as a pet, it really is a lifelong commitment. Um, it's a perpetual two-year-old in your house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you love these birds and you want to be with them and, and you still are fascinated by them, want a closer contact, there are so many other options. There are rescues that have birds, maybe not a big bird. I would never recommend, ever recommend a bird like this for a first-time bird owner. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are many rescues. There are even some stores that you can go in and visit birds all the time, rehab centers. Um, so they so, can volunteer. Absolutely. Or volunteer with organizations that work, work with them. So get a hamster or a lizard or something, a fish. Um, birds are a little bit more of a commitment. Now, we're going to go into our next segment of our program, which I'm really excited about, and talking about culturally um, how these beautiful macaws have um, been around. And I don't know, do you think Bonita can see this beautiful drawing of our parrot? What do you think about that, Bonita? Can you see that parrot? I know she's very aware and can see the colors. And such. they might be a little too stylized or to really identify. I have witnessed them absolutely identifying an image of a macaw, whether it be a painting or uh, very lifelike drawing. Um, they they always identify uh, and the birds on the TV or the. What about the outside? It, birds are about around your home. Uh, yes. They pay attention oh, to Oh, very much so. They're very aware of the other birds, especially, you know, the ravens and the hawks and other little birds that are hummingbirds. With their color, it's quite frequently, actually, when they're outside, the hummingbirds will come up and check them out like they're a big red flower. Oh. <laughs> That yeah, would fun. that would be fun. That they look fun. at that yeah. hummingbird, and the hummingbird's like. <laughs> Today we have Kelly's, and Kelly, would you like to come over? Sure, Mary. Thanks. My name's Kelly Gilpin, and I'm the curator of anthropology here at the Museum of Northern Arizona. And I've been working here in different ways for about 20 years. And this is the first time we've had that I know of that we've had a live animal, especially a. Uh, a beautiful macaw like this. Hi, Bonita. <laughs> and it's good to see you again, Kelly. Nice to see you. <laughs> Why don't you tell us, Kelly, the work that you have done around the Colorado Plateau, the, even as far as the Southwest, and you have seen um, the ancestral Puebloan people um, here of the Colorado, you have seen that they've had these beautiful birds, which exactly. is interesting. And Kelly and I have talked about this before with some of our other friends who are archaeologists, and we're all really interested in the evidence that ancestral Pueblo people, the ancestors of the Hopi, um, Pueblo of Zuni, Pueblo of Acoma, and the Pueblos over in New Mexico, have had macaws from Central America, from Southern Mexico, for almost a thousand years, and maybe a little bit longer than a thousand years. So they've been interested, they knew about these birds, even though they don't live and breed up here naturally, but they, they brought them from Southern Mexico all the way to the Pueblos over a thousand years ago. 
And so we find their bones and we find pictures of them in the artworks. And where we are right now is in front of a, a beautiful painting that my friends Michael and Delbridge did in 2001. And they were inspired by ancient mural paintings from about the 1400s, so before the Spaniards settled and started missions here in the Southwest, about 100 years before those Spanish missions started. They painted mural paintings in some of their own buildings on plastered walls, and some of the pictures they painted were of scarlet macaws. Very neat. As a person who takes care of this beautiful bird, um, why don't we imagine moving from, you said South America, Central America, Central America okay, and they were moving these birds up to here so that they, they could tra trade with them. How difficult do you think that I think it could have been very, very difficult um, because we have to look at different things here. Probably, okay, we can look at first if the bird was, was young. The bird was young. Yes, it's small. It's not flighted. Mm -hmm. um, they're easy to carry. For the first three months of their life, they're in that little nest. So you could almost repeat that in a burden basket or some, somehow. But we have the issue of feeding the bird. Uh, these birds have to be fed uh, quite a number of times throughout the day. And they don't eat just, you can't just put that, those seed, uh, grain, fruit in front of that bird and eat. The food has to be, it has to be basically masticated by humans or ground or somehow or another and then delivered to the bird. A, a female, uh, the mother bird, when she feeds that baby, she ingests the food, it goes into the crop, which is the first part of the digestive system. It slowly then is ground and dissolved to a degree, to a pulp-like uh, consistency, or finer actually, even, like baby food consistency. And then she regurgitates that into the mouth of the baby. So the challenge is then getting that food delivered to that baby in an efficient manner that that bird then is provided the nutrition that it needs. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we have going on is the bird um, their, their undeveloped immune system, their um, natural uh, biota, which is a gram positive or gram negative, we're introducing foreign bacteria, the stress on the animal, you got a lot of things going on. And then after an extended period of time of travel, you've got those issues. Then if you have the bird a little older, again, you know, the bird is flighted. Well, how do you keep control of that bird? Mm -hmm. Um, to cage these birds is very difficult, even in contemporary times, we have to use metal cages or else they can chew right through. Yeah. Um, they, the PSI is 1,200 um, is that the pressure? The that pounds per square inch okay. on that beak, so they could bust through a woven, a beautifully woven, or even if it was a, 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 an animal skin, <laughs> a hide, they're going to chew through it. Wow. Some very um, scary things to think about would be, you know, other ways to hobble the bird. What does hobble mean? A uh, hobble would be to um, uh, prevent that bird, somehow or another hinder a limb to prevent that bird. In this case, it would be the wing. So, so it couldn't fly. Right. So, I mean, it, and I know um, in modern times, some of um, the um, <laughs> poachers or when birds were brought in from the wild uh, for the pet trade, they would break a wing. Wow. And, um, and again. And so it's, it's not an easy task. I mean, even though my birds 
she's trained to free fly and I could walk down certain areas. We can take them out and walk and hike with our birds and they fly and come back to us. You still have then that possibility of the predator chasing off the bird or something scaring the bird. And then, you know, your schedule, if you're trying to hike up here, you know, from Mexico or wherever, you know, that you're, you've got all kinds of issues. Very difficult. So we've heard the from the kind of like the bird's perspective <laughs> now let's talk about scientifically what what do you think happened because there's been studies and you you have all looked at this right we we have and we have no way of knowing how the bird felt whether the bird was happy about it but we we do know a little bit from pictures that were painted on pottery in southwestern new mexico in right around 1100 AD. So if you're um, of European descent like me, you might think, oh, that's the time a lot of the big cathedrals were being built in, in France and Spain and England. So those, those um, medieval times. And around that time, we had a culture in southwestern New Mexico called the Mimbres which just, it's, it's not a native word, it just means willow trees, it's a Spanish word that refers to that area. So we don't know what they called themselves or what language they spoke, but we know they were ancestral Pueblo people, and the people at Acoma and Zuni and Hopi recognize a lot of the images on their pottery. And again, some of the pictures they painted were of macaws, and we can tell they're macaws by the hooked beak and the tail feathers, and some of these pictures show women, female individuals, carrying baskets on their back, kind of triangular burden baskets about this big, with a strap across the forehead to the basket, and we have sitting on those baskets. So they're not enclosed in any way, and they don't appear to be tethered, but there could have been hobbles or something, you know, that aren't shown by the artist. But their tail feathers are usually very short depictions of the birds being transported. And Kelly here tells me that probably means they're juveniles, less than a year old, and they would have been a little easier to carry. They would have been bonded to those women who were carrying them because they get very attached to, to their human moms, so to speak, because that's who's feeding them. And they can't take care of themselves yet and then some of the bones that we have found in Pueblo sites are also juvenile birds. So some of them didn't make it to be a whole year old or, or two years old, and probably not very many of them in this climate made it to be the size of Benita here at, at four years old. So that seems like a lot of trouble to, to go through. Why? I know that we couldn't ask them, but I know that there's been some theories, some ideas about why did they go through this trouble. Mm -hmm. And the way we learn about that is by asking the descendants of ancestral Pueblo people. So the ancestors, the, the old people who are no longer with us, and then we have the descendants today. They're great, 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 great grandchildren living in the Pueblos today. And we can see that these birds are still important in their artworks. There's a parrot clan in almost all of the Pueblos and they say that's our relative, you know, that our relatives took care of these birds and we're related to them and we have responsibilities to them and they help take care of us. And the whole community says that's important, you know, that's, this is part of the world of nature taking care of, of us. And these birds in particular, because of their bright red colors and the way they behave, they're associated with the south, where they come from, the direction south. They're associated with the sun and with the agricultural growing season. So these are farmers. And your crops grow in the summer when the sun shines and then the summer rainstorms come. And you know you're going to have a good, a good harvest. If it doesn't get warm enough, in the summer up here in the north, your, your crops aren't gonna grow. So the idea is that these birds come from the south and they bring the warmth with them and they bring the sun back after the winter season so that it'll get warm and your, your crops will grow. 
and you can see in the murals that our artists are talking about this here, we've got corn plants just about ready to be harvested, and some of the corn's blue, yellow, white, and red, just like our macaw. The corn comes in all those colors. And we have, oh, she knows we're talking about her. You know you're special. <laughs> so this is a, a woman holding the macaws, just like we see in the, in the ancient art in the murals in the 1400s, but also earlier in the Membrace pottery. She's a young woman about to be married, or she's eligible to be married. She's a teenager. Um, with her butterfly hair whorls there that also represent the growing season and summer and fertility. She's surrounded by dragonflies, so we know it's summer, and we're thinking about harvest, we're thinking about fertility and growth, and, and she's got a scarlet macaw in each hand there, just representing all of those symbols of abundance and summer and warmth and, and the sunshine. And if we can go over here, we'll see another scarlet macaw above the shoulder of this corn maiden. So she is the human embodiment of corn, of all of those different colors. The dots on her body represent corn. And she has birds and feathers, and here's probably macaw tail feathers up here. This could be a very stylized macaw. And this one has the white head, like you see on Vanita, the beak is white and the eye, and here's the red feathers, long tail feathers, but they're very simplified. So we could say this is stylized or it's a symbol. And what I think is really interesting here is the artists have painted the wings more like human hands. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me think of this is the human embodiment or expression or a human version of corn and maybe this is a human macaw, a, a, a parrot clan person, or somebody who's transforming into a human or a human transforming into a, a bird, but we can relate to them as, as if they're human, human relatives. Wow. So it's really in this mural that we're looking at, and maybe some of the things that you said, it's, it's really seems like a lot of respect was given, at least with our artwork and the, and the way that we see the parrot with the incestual Pueblo and that they really mm -hmm. respected um, and looked after the, the macaws. They did. We think they had a, a very caring and respectful relationship. What we know from the animal bones in Pueblo sites, they ate a lot of rabbits. So the eagles and hawks and the raptors we were talking about as hunters um, were very important as mentors or teaching about hunting so that the young boys could hunt rabbits and, and bring them home for, for meat. And then this one was more important, I would say, in religion and ritual. And it's not something you would see every day in a, a Pueblo. It was probably a very special rare event to actually see one in person. So you're probably learning about them through the pictures painted on pottery or on the wall murals, but it must have been a really spectacular occurrence when, when somebody actually brought a bird to the village and you hear them call and some of them talk mm -hmm. and they like to hang upside down and they're very playful. Mm -hmm. Very engaging. Yes, well it has been a very special um, event to have uh, Bonita here and to have you both here um, letting us know and, and Bonita is letting us know too all about her. I thought that it would be fun to make our own macaw parrot since um, Kelly was talking to us about how not so easy having a macaw for a pet would be Maybe you would like to make your own little macaw parrot and um, it will help you think of summer coming up in the warm sunny days and um, all of the bright colors that will be coming up for summer. So in order to do this, this will be on our website and it is a pattern. 
This is going to be the actual kind of um, head and neck of the parrot, okay? And then remember how we talked about how important the beak is. That's one of the things that you can look at that you know that it's a macaw, a parrot, um, because of that curved beak. And then we will get beautiful um, construction paper, any kind of paper, colored paper that you have at home, and we'll get the different colors, the reds. Um, I remember that Bonita had green and some yellow and blue. So we'll get some colored paper to make those beautiful feathers. And remember the macaw, another marking of the macaw is the real long uh, kind of tail feathers that they have. So those are the things that we want to create for our craft macaw parrot. So once you um, have gotten your little pattern of the body, neck and head part and the beak part, you wanna print that out, okay? And then you're gonna need scissors and you're gonna need um, some kind of glue. I like using sticks, the glue sticks, they're not as messy. Um, and this is up to you if you have this at home, a popsicle stick, or any kind of stick like this, and you can actually turn your macaw craft into a puppet, okay? So let's get started. We have our pattern, and we'll need to carefully, around the black lines, um, do, cut this out. So some of us are still little and learning how to use scissors. So you may need to ask a grown-up to help you cut this out and be very careful using scissors. And so there is the head part and the neck uh, breast kind of part of our macaw. It doesn't look like that yet, but it will. Okay, and then we cannot forget to cut out the beak. And... We're just gonna go again, uh, again, follow those black lines and carefully cut out the beak to your parrot. Okay, so now we have that curved beak that macaws are famous and parrots are famous for. So here is our pattern. Now, you can do one of two things. If you happen to not have colored paper, because that's not always laying around, you can actually use this as your parrot and you would just color it um, with crayons or markers, what you have at home, and just color this part. And if you have white paper, like computer paper, you can use the computer paper and then use your crayons to bring color to it, okay? but. We're going to start off, I'm looking at our little stuffed parrot here, and I notice how the head and the neck area are red, okay? And the eye, remember how uh, Kelly talked to us, they have like what looks like it's naked here around their eye, but remember she said they still had some little feathers, um, but this area is white. So, it might be even better to use this and color this so you can keep that white part. I think what I'm going to do um, for our white part is I will use some of this pa white paper and I will put it on our red paper because the head and breast area are red and I will make a white spot. So what I'm going to do, since I'm going to use the red paper, is now I'm going to trace that pattern that I cut out, and I'm going to carefully go around, and I have a pencil, and I carefully trace that. Now, I'm going to cut again. Now we're going to cut out this um, head and neck. Put that aside. So. Now we have this part. And I'm looking again at my little stuffed animal. I am going to make a circle 
Do you remember what a circle looks like? Um, mine's probably gonna look, look more like an oval. <laughs> and maybe its eye is gonna be, remember how Kelly was talking to us about how, um, because macaw parrots, they can be hunted. Remember, they have some dangers out there in the wild. And remember how we know that animals that are preyed upon or hunted, their eyes are at the side of their heads instead of the front. Um, so they can be watching all over. Um, so remember that the white piece to the parrot's eyes are gonna be on the side of its head, okay? And we're going to glue this white piece on to the parrot's face, side of the face there, okay. And I think it would also be good before I lose it to get the beak and get that on there too. So it kind of starts maybe looking like a parrot. There we go. Now it's starting to look like a parrot. Okay. We'll kind of make his beak, um, Bonita and Sedona's beak was had like a little bit of yellowish to it. It wasn't pure white. And it also had, I remember, it had some black, kind of some black in it too. And look at the eye, okay? So I remembered this too, that Bonita and Sedona, of course, they had the black part in the eye, just like we have, okay? That helps us to see. Um, and then they have this yellow kind of color around the black. So if you want your parrot to be realistic looking, um, I would start with a little black circle like that. And then I'm gonna get some nice yellow and I'm gonna go around that black part in a circle. We're making a lot of circles today, okay? Look how much this is shaping up. Isn't it starting to look like a bird? You might have done this craft kind of before with another kind of bird. Now, so we have the red part. Now we wanna start making the wing part and the tail part, okay? And um, I'm gonna start with green. And you're gonna get your hand, okay? And you're going to trace your hand. Now, for some of you, it might be a little difficult. You might wanna trace your left hand if you're right-handed because I, I am so used to using my right hand that I don't know if I could trace um, with the other hand. But whether you're right-handed or left-handed, you just trace your hand. And then we're gonna do some more cutting. And as I'm cutting, I'm kind of thinking about our day. It was a really fun day. And we got to meet a lot of nice friends. Kelly, Kelly uh, T with her birds. I've never met Macaws before. And so that was fun to have Kelly T and her beautiful Sedona and Bonita. Those were some new friends we met. It's so nice to work in a place where you get to meet so many interesting people. Do you get to go places, maybe at school, or maybe you have family members that are very interesting people? It's kind of neat to learn from others. Okay. So we have our first green feather. Now, your hands are gonna be littler than mine, okay? So just remember that. And so you may want to do a lot of hands cut, it, cut out, or you may just want to do a few. It's whatever you think. And you get your glue. I don't think that we're going to put the glue on the fingers part, which is like the feather part. We don't need glue there, okay? We only need it on the base here for it to stick, okay? So you don't have to get crazy with the glue. 
okay? Just kind of get a little bit of glue up there on the top of the hand print. So when you have some glue on, and we're not putting, again, we're not putting it on the fingers, let's start at the bottom because we're building our parrot. And when you build something like blocks or Legos, you start at the bottom, you have a foundation. So you start at the bottom and you work up. So we're gonna put our green feathers um, here and it doesn't have to be straight, okay? So what other color? Or you know what, I'm remembering the yellow was right next to the green on Bonita and Sedona. So yellow like the sun, remember? Kelly was talking to us about um, the ancient Pabuan people. They liked these um, parrots because it, part of it reminded them of the sun, okay? So again, we just get our hand, all of our tools are Right here, we're gonna get our hand again, and we're gonna trace that hand. And we're gonna cut out another set of feathers. So we're gonna do some more cutting. You will be very good at cutting, the more practice you get, okay? And if it looks a little, you know, if it doesn't look as smooth, you know, I've been cutting for a long time. If yours is kind of a little bit like you stop and start and stop and start, that's okay because remember, especially Sedona's feathers, they weren't perfectly smooth. You know, she had she had some feathers that were kind of sticking out and um, a little frayed. And you know, that's not a bad thing. That's just nature, you know? Nature isn't perfect, so we don't have to be perfect. The other thing I remember Kelly T was talking about with the birds, the, the macaws, is she was saying, think about when the ancient Puebloan people came, brought them here, and they had them here. We have winter here, and these macaws, they're not used to winter. But I was talking to Kelly about that, and she said that the ancient uh, Puebloan people knew how to take care of them and would keep them warm. And they adapted, the parrots adapted pretty well. They got used to it, okay? And think about a time that you had to adapt to something. We've had to adapt to a lot of changes since COVID, and um, it's kind of, good for us to look at kind of how parrots adapted to their surroundings. We can learn how to adapt too. Okay, so we're kind of building on our feathers, okay? And I kind of put it at an angle, it's not perfectly straight, and, and it's okay that the hands, which are really the feathers, are supposed to be the feathers, um, it's okay that they're on top of each other because the feathers were like that. Look at the feathers here and they're on top of each other, right? Okay, what color do you think we're missing? What about blue? I love blue. Okay, so we have some blue. Sometimes people ask me, what's my favorite color? And I love color so much that I really don't have a favorite color. Do you have a favorite color? Maybe it's one of the colors that you're gonna be using on your macaw. So we just kind of go back and forth and up and down with our scissors. Okay, and then again, we're gonna put a little bit of glue up at the top so it, our feathers stay. Now, I'm gonna go up the neck, and I think this is a really good place. Now, see how I have some kind of leftover points there? 
I think it would be better if we kind of cut those off so it's a little bit more rounded to the pattern, to the parrot. So what do you think? You have your own little macaw. Now, if you want to turn it into a, pu a puppet, um, you can do that. You can get a popsicle stick, turn your parrot to the back, and put a little glue on your popsicle stick at the top. So we put some glue at the top of the stick and we, we glued it onto the red part of the body, okay? Now, see how it's just not real, it's, it's cute, it's cute, but it's not real stable, so, or strong. So what we think is if we use our pattern again, if you still have your pattern, and put glue on your pattern, kind of all over it, and then glue the pattern on to the parrot. And we may have to do some trimming, okay? See how that, see how our parrot now looks like it's sitting on your hand. Isn't that cute? Or you can just put some tape or little magnet, sticky magnet pieces and put it on your refrigerator or tape and put it in your window and we can trim up. You know what, I just had this great idea. I love doing crafts with you. Um, see how this, they have, I don't remember this, but on our little parrot stuffed animal, how it's black. Let's get a black crayon. And we're gonna put some black underneath there. And so you have your very good looking, realistic parrot. So I have hoped you've had fun today. I hope that you've learned a lot. Um, I sure had fun and I learned so much today and that's why I love doing this program and I love seeing you each month. And I just wanna say thank you for joining us and have fun with your parrot.